finish it. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the ELT in a content and post COVID world hosted by uh, Colin Bethel. Colin, uh, amongst many other things, has a distinguished and long career in ELT in Japan and is currently working uh, with English Book Stock JP. And Colin, um, would you like to take Q&A at the end? How long would you like to leave? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just go through. Uh, I, this could take, we, I don't mind taking questions as we go through either. So let's see how it goes. But um, okay. yeah. I'll anybody has a question as we go through, if they could pop that in the chat, I'll bring that up with Colin and then we can take Q&A at the end. So Colin, over to you. Great, okay. Well, thank you for coming. I'm Colin, uh, Colin Bethel. Uh, I currently, work for English Books JP um, and I thought this would be a way to contribute to the event by um, trying to predict the future a little bit. So first of all, this is where we sort of immediately get a little bit Q&A like, is um, why are we here today? So um, <clears throat> presumably you're here because you've seen what this presentation is. Uh, Somewhere. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so what we're here for is really to look at educational content and how it relates to our situation. So of course, uh, I will make a few assumptions, but feel free to drop in the chat if you want, um, rather than let me assume, if you want to sort of suggest areas for me to cover. Um, so do that either in this or the, the next couple of slides as I show you where I think we're going with this. So to discuss content now and how it relates to our, meaning your uh, teaching situation or your learning situation or your school situation, if you're running a school or if you're part of a, a school that's being managed around you, or it could be a business that's not just a school or it could be a school business um, or any other educational environment. So first of all, just do feel free to drop in the chat uh, anything that you would like me to address. Um, and let me take you to the next couple of slides to show you where my sort of eye, a bit of this last eye there. So how did we get to this situation? How did we get here uh, and where is here? Well, I'll kick this off by sharing how I got here um, and where it is for me. And then this is where feel free to drop questions in either in the chat or raise your hand and uh, speak. Uh, and I can take it in any number of different directions. And that's because um, this is how I got here. So on the right, you can see the bookseller, distributor, publisher of educational toys, digital solutions and books. Um, that that's what I'm doing now. Now, if we start with the green, um, I first started teaching in 1989. That was in the UK. And then I came to Japan shortly after. Uh, and taught in Japan for a while and then moved into, so if you see the gray, started with the green, move into the gray. Uh, I moved into ELT print publishing, which was actually with Cambridge um, for about four years, three to four years in Japan again. Uh, and then I came back from Japan to the UK where I'm from uh, and moved into professional and academic print publishing around about 19, 96. And that was pretty much before the internet. Yeah, certainly, that was. Uh, I mean, it was there, but it wasn't widely used. And around about 96 was when the news was, I mean, people on the news on the TV were still using www dot at that time because it was so new. We didn't know that that was what you had to do. So I put this little yellow arrow in because this is for me when when digital first started uh, in, the in the educational environment. Now, of course, we all know that universities for probably a decade or so before had been using email and the internet anyway. Uh, but this is certainly my experience when I came to it. And then the arrow you can see is inside the green when I'm doing my print job. And then I moved into digital academic publishing uh, with, um, from a research base and actually microform and CD. So 
what that means is that was for me 1998 that was my first experience of digital publishing uh, but what it was was digitization of things such as uh, the London Times for the last 200 years or the entire archive of the Communist um, Party in Russia. Uh, so the publishing company I was with then <clears throat> was taking hold of anything that was analog. And it wasn't just print, it was uh, microform. So microfilm, microfiche uh, and print. Uh, there was a, a library in Scotland tearing up the old newspapers uh, that they had in storage uh, and actually throwing them away after they'd been scanned, uh, which was heartbreaking to see. See sort of one and nearly 200 year old newspapers piled up in the office bound for the skip because that's what digitization was becoming. Uh, and of course, we don't really think about that too much now. The fact it is digitized, it's very robust. It'll continue forever as long as somebody hosts it. Uh, so just moving around into the next yellow, um, we can see that uh, I then moved again, and but I stayed fairly digital there, worked with bibliographic and aggregated databases and medical uh, information in particular. Uh, and then in the final yellow on the top right uh, left here, uh, I actually spent some time in what we call EdTech, um, which is, you know, it, in this case, it was 3D video. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality for education and that took in connections to learner management systems lms's of which there are hundreds and then for reasons which i don't even sure i know them really but i i ended up coming back to japan uh and concentrating on domestic book selling really although the company i work for does sell educational toys as well in fact, the reason for mentioning that is that one of the most recent toy lines is actually non-digital. It, it, it goes out of its way to say to parents in Japan, this is the, the last chance you've got really to play card games uh, before your kids get smartphones. So why don't you enjoy these games as a, as a family before the inevitable happens? And it's not saying that's bad. It's just saying that, you know, this is an era of life. So before I move on, uh, Simon, I, I can't actually see the chat because uh, at the moment I've got so much going on on the screen. Yep. Have a look. Okay. I think I can now. Yep, nothing in chat at the moment. Okay, that's fine. So uh, I'm just going to pause just on this slide for a moment. So what I've shown is, is how I got here. Now, you will have got here wherever here is in a slightly different way, but... Um, as teachers or publishers or authors, um, whatever you're doing, running a school, um, the digital part of educational materials is going to mean something slightly different to all of us. So, there we go. Uh, so let's, um, to kick off a bit of thought about this, we look at some winners and losers. Uh, in print and digital. Now, this is all very simple. So I've thrown things together really to make food for thought, I hope. Um, so in print, uh, and, let, and let's say it's a book, then in print, things are simple. It's simple to order a book. It's simple to use a book. You just pick it up and you open their pages. Uh, to store it, you just put it in your bag or on the bookshelf or in your desk or wherever. Um, so there's nothing complicated about using a book, really. And also, everybody knows how to do it. And so there's no explanation, no support required. Um, but on the downside, um, books are heavy. And it's amazing, you know, uh, I mean, with textbooks, I'm guessing that students kind of resent carrying heavy textbooks now. Uh, in the same way that I, to my own amazement, I'm quite surprised that I find a book a reading book for a business trip kind of cumbersome and heavy now and I want it on Kindle because then I don't have to carry the extra weight and um, I'm quite surprised at that but it's something that's happened and cost well we'll just look at cost a bit later so on the digital side just to throw it out there though in theory I'd say the winning side it, it could say, certainly save us time on assessment so I'm guessing and if there's anybody here who wants to comment 
to say it's right or wrong or anything different, then go ahead. But surely the last year, the pandemic has, has thrown teachers into online and that must have been scary. But on the other hand, most teachers have realized that, hang on a minute, the assessment's a lot easier if people are submitting things online because I don't have to touch it. I don't have to carry it at home. I don't have to read it in and sort of assess it. I don't have to write things down and then equate them over somewhere else. Um, so there's lots of different ways, whether it's a, a formal assessment or whether it's just homework. Um, assessment is a, is a winner from digital, I would say. Very subjective statements, but it's just to get us thinking. So uh, winners and losers, though, I mean, the trouble is there, and I learned this when I was in EdTech, that there are literally hundreds of companies offering hundreds of LMSs. So if you are a teacher and you go to one school, it's not like using a textbook that you might be familiar with from, say, Oxford or Cambridge, and then you move to another school and you're using another textbook, which is pretty similar. You may even have used it before. But if you move schools or classes, or even if your administration just changes what they're doing, you can find yourself learning and being subjected to different unique systems online or offline, but digital that need a certain set of um, skills to be able to use it. Uh, everything's done in a slightly different way, in the same way that some of us use a Macintosh and some of us use PCs. Um, so another side of digital is the tangibility for the users and the parents. Well, I think um, there's a lot of people for and a lot of people against, and uh, depending on your school, and your position, uh, that, that's going to vary. Um, but it's something perhaps probably more important than anything else on this page, apart from well, maybe cost, but um, the tangibility for the users, and I put parents because they're the people paying the bill if you're um, educating children. Uh, if it's adults, obviously they would probably be paying for themselves, directly or indirectly, whether it's through their university or whether it's you know, out their own pocket. So that tangibility is something we'll come back to in terms of let's keep sight of what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, support. Uh, so unlike a book, not everybody can use the LMS you just paid a lot of money for, uh, but everybody is going to need training on whatever digital thing you put into place. And again, that's a kind of a critical, uh, oversimplified, but critical point, even to the point that... Um, if you have a class of 10 students, it's pretty much a dead certain that 30% will forget their password every single time. It will not be the same 30% uh, or something else similar will happen, like they clear out their browser or they change their device. Uh, so we need to watch out for the amount of time we spend on these things like getting the Wi-Fi working, making sure the password and usernames are there, memory is bandwidth. And again, I've put cost at the bottom there because uh, cost is going to be critical. Okay, still, uh, do you know if you want me to take this in any direction? Because as we get into this and the, perhaps the next slide, um, I think there's, there's a risk that we could go. And if I talk alone, I can just be talking about my chosen subject. But actually, we could go in any direction here. So let's have a look. So we've looked at some winners and losers. Now let's just sort of throw a, an oversimplified diagram together. So uh, we're looking at materials <clears throat> as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, which I am guessing will probably happen over the next uh, nine months or so. Um, all the signs at the moment are that um, uh, many developed nations are trying to uh, normalize, for want of a better word. Um, certainly Japan, you know, and Western Europe, America, the countries seem to be trying to get back to some kind of place close to where they were. Um, so if that continues, then we can expect to be coming out of this situation in about nine months to 12 months, I imagine. So we will be different, of course. So things that we might be thinking about are things such as face-to-face -face teaching versus online teaching. And that's something, of course, there were online schools, but most of us were not thinking 
in deeply about the difference between face-to-face -face and online teaching before the pandemic. Print materials versus digital materials. Of course, there were plenty of digital materials around, you know, three, five years ago, even 10 years ago. But here in Japan, in our teaching, learning or business running, meaning a school business situation, many, many of us had never really thought deeply about the use of digital materials or uh, it's a continuum. There are some people that use a little bit, some people that didn't really want to use it. Some people probably never thought about it. Um, and some people that were very, you know, gung-ho to use whatever's new. All of those situations are equally fine. But what we're gonna find now is that it's not, it's not so easy to choose perhaps. So then in the bottom circle, you've got online versus offline uh, and digital devices. And that one I've thrown in, it may not be quite so obvious that one, but in the two uh, circles at the top, you really have to be thinking about the one at the bottom as well. Um, so when you teach online, Zoom, if, it, if that's something I think we're all familiar with because we're having this session now, um, then everybody's online. But of course, there could be people that watch this um, offline. Either it's streamed from a site um, afterwards, uh, which is not purely offline, uh, or it might be downloadable somewhere. Say I might put it on our website, it might be downloadable, somebody downloads it and they watch it when they're in a railway tunnel. Um, but when we teach and, and learn, we need to think about the devices and whether the items need to be online or offline uh, all the time or part of the time. Time. Um, it's, and then does it need to be online 100% of the time or offline? And then just coming in for 10 seconds to download everything. So these are kind of critical slide. This is slide is a critical slide to always keep in mind. And what I'll do is I'll I'll go through everything, and then we can always flip back at the end in in Q and A's. So. So moving a bit more onto content now. So in a sense, these the, the sort of talk so far has really set the scene, I, I hope. Um, now, in order to address content itself, um, we need to think about um, things such as, uh, if we select a book now, um, how can we be sure we can use it if we go online again. Um, so um, the content of the book is now, and I know this from a book selling point of view, because um, to share a bit about what I'm doing now, uh, over the last year, when the uh, pandemic started a year and a half ago, um, I think my industry was very fortunate because in Japan, it was the end of March, by which time most of the orders for books were already on the back of trucks, which means that people had made conventional decisions uh, in a normal time frame. And by the time these books were delivered to their locations in schools and uh, bookshops, uh, yeah, most of it was not canceled. Uh, and I consider myself and my industry very fortunate in that respect. Um, but you know, it's the timing had to happen sometime anyway. So again, there's always winners and losers. But the point is that a year on, uh, last March, meaning March 2021, that was different because everybody by that time was uh, well familiar with what the pandemic meant and their selection of books was very much uh, focused on the question of what happens if. So yes, I'm selecting a book, I might be teaching face-to-face, -face, I might be teaching online. So that's taught us an awful lot uh, in the industry about which books have remained popular and which ones have not, uh, which types of books are, are popular and which types are not popular. And our inquiries have completely changed nature. So uh, over the course of the last year, the questions we've been getting on the phone and by email and through our website, have definitely changed. And these comments start to reflect some of those things. 
So if I stop using books and go digital to future proof my classes, um, you know, what's that going to mean for my content? And we'll, we'll come on and look at that. So my students, their parents expect me to go digital. Now, I don't know how widespread this is, but um, there is a certain amount of expectation. Um, and for example, it's, I've heard it banded around the, the pandemic of the principal has decided that every student will have an iPad in class, which I've never really understood why. Um, and when I ask questions like that, I've never found the answer particularly compelling. Uh, often it seems that decisions like that are based in some kind of distraction about the technology itself, rather than anything to do with the content and the way the students interact with it. So we need, what, we need to watch out for that. Um, and I don't know how widespread this would be with parents. My guess is it's not quite so widespread, but they may well be pushed onto a bandwagon about technology. So they think digital must be a good idea because they've heard a lot about it, but perhaps they don't actually know. Um, with parents, I really don't have the exposure to that because my exposure is mainly to teachers and students and school administrators. So the next consideration is being committed to uh, a digital hybrid, um, but not sure where you get the, the criteria to make the best decision about that. So what I mean by this is um, you may use your conventional textbook, but you may also choose, hang on, the assessment, that's good. I want some digital assessment. So I'm going to buy this digital thingy because it can do my assessment and I can link it to this book. So that's great. So I don't have to mark homework and it's much more accurate. It's much quicker. Uh, students will probably like it more. So yeah, that's my little digital hybrid. Another obvious digital hybrid is um, larger publishers in particular, and to some extent smaller publishers, but not so much um, because of the costs, uh, are setting up versions. So you can have your, and our, you know, we know some of the big brands like um, Headway and Interchange and um, the uh, Four Borders that Cambridge have, they've all got, uh, I think Let's Go from Oxford, they've all got digital bits now. Uh, and you can teach with a book or you can teach uh, in some cases with their workbook or the digital workbook. And uh, the difference between them is, well, we all know it is 300 yen uh, or thereabouts, um, but then we have to deal with the technical difference between them, which is basically some kind of access to some kind of unique system online that you and your students need to learn. There are probably lots of others, but these are just a few concerns about content. Now, if anybody has any specific concerns about content, this is a really good time to send the chat or um, to get a question ready for a bit later, um, because that's an area where I'm hoping I can help, um, because we will have had an inquiry about it, I expect. Okay, so... This is something that occurred to me. This is a very personal example, but um, before we go into sort of a, a list of other considerations, let's just look at cost for a moment because I've come across as a bookseller, uh, not just as a bookseller, but um, when I was in publishing previously, uh, and even in personal life, the expectation that digital is somehow free. And I don't know where that comes from. I think it comes from lots of different places. Um, but I mentioned earlier, and it was on purpose I mentioned this, it's, it sounds irrelevant, but it's not. Things like the digitization of the Communist Party of Russia was the largest digital collection I was selling as a fresh young salesperson at that time back in 1998. It was supplied on uh, in segments, and each segment was actually about a hundred rolls of microfilm that were digitized, and they all fitted into a certain amount of you know, space, gigabytes. 
And each one of those segments was sold firstly on CD and then online for approximately £30,000 per section, which meant that if you bought the whole thing, it was caught a quarter of a million pounds. So it's getting on for 400000 300000 350000 US dollars worth. Um, to libraries, university libraries, and uh, my area was Asia and Australasia, so um, these were going to places like, you know, the University of Otago and Melbourne, and things like that, and they were buying it gradually over time. Uh, so digital was never free anyway, in my opinion. Um, now, in recent years, we, there is this part of our life that seems to have an expectation of digital being free. So what I did was I put this personal example together because this year um, was my daughter's final year at university in the UK. And it got me thinking because we, her and I had lots of conversations. We shared a lot of um, time talking through the anxieties of her last year uh, for a, uh, an undergraduate. And, you know, she shared a lot of her experiences with me. And as a publisher, I was immensely interested to hear what was going on. So what I did very quickly was I compared my experience as a undergraduate in 1980 in 2021. And this is, these numbers will not be perfect, but I did these as well as I could. And I did things like exchange rates. I put it all into yen. Now, when I was an undergraduate, I spent really, my money really only meant went on books. So um, tuition fees and accommodation, all of that is aside, and I'm assuming it has not changed. But in terms of what I spent as a person on my academic uh, three years at university, then I came up with a number in pounds that equated to, I think I put it in something like 30 books, uh, that I, you know, academic books that I paid out for myself and a little bit of stationery. And it's probably about Rockman N. And that's over three years. Now, what I did at the bottom here is to be a bit generous about it, I, I, doubled, I more than doubled that um, to say, well, inflation, because I know for a fact, as a student, one of the things I was very aware of was that the price of a pint of beer in the UK hit one pound whilst I was at uh, university. University there, uh, and now it's something three pounds. Now beer doesn't go up at the same price as books, but inflation is definitely there. So my calculation here on the right is that a student now needs the hardware, which is at least a hundred thousand yen. Their Wi-Fi. Now this is two years of off-site Wi-Fi. So over somebody has to pay for this as a student off-site because they're no longer on university accommodation, so they're paying on their own bills. This is a bill I never had. And it's probably about 100,000 yen over two years. Um, not everybody buys a printer, but um, I know that my daughter left university with a printer and a pile of paper this big, uh, like a foot thick, that is probably now being binned. I still have my book from university. So the university digital, digital access and the library costs are the same as the uh, access I had to the library when I was younger. Um, and, and yet I make the cost of her, sorry, the cost of her um, expenditure more than double, really more than double or about double what I spent. So digital is actually possibly more expensive. And when we look at the ELT environment, and what we're asking our students to buy in the way of, um, first of all, the hardware, then the Wi-Fi, um, you've already spent three times more than the book anyway, when you get to that point. So we have to think about lots of different things. Okay. So watch out for the costs of digital. Um, now, this is something I feel pretty passionately about. And I am a bookseller now, but we have a very diverse business, so I don't feel at all threatened by the digital era. Um, and we will sell books for as long as people want them, but we will also move into digital things when people need those. But it won't be quite the same as the place that publishers go to. Um, so there are, even at this event today, um, a couple of very good presentations. Simon's done one. But these digital offerings will continue, 
um, but we need to think about how they work for us. So with digital, you can get free things. So on the right, I've written down the free, and on the left, I've written down the paid. Now, the lists are pretty much the same, but the thing is, when you pay for it, you can be pretty demanding about the support you get from the person you buy it from. If it's free, well, you didn't pay anything, so why should they give up their time to help you out? They've given you the platform. You may not feel that way, but it's a harsh reality. How could anybody who's not being paid afford to spend the time to support you? Um, and we can see elements of that when we go to things, I know it's not quite the same, but if you buy your books on Amazon or if you go to any other uh, online portal these days, the ability to actually get human support is becoming pushed aside uh, more and more. And I think we've all experienced that. Well, that's one of the reasons because you're not paying any more books on Amazon. You're probably even paying less. Uh, so they can't actually afford, they won't make a profit. I'm saying they can't afford it. They won't make a profit if they give you more time, HR time that costs them money than the book you've just bought or whatever it is you're buying. So you've got to think about these things and the infrastructure, it all comes down to the same thing. The infrastructure um, needs to be maintained. Uh, and if you're not paying for it, then I think that maintenance comes down to you. Uh, HR, uh, that means the amount of time you're putting in. So if it's paid, uh, you're probably putting in less time. If it's free, then you might have to put the time in and that's OK as long as you're ready for it. Uh, and hardware, uh, I did mention in the Venn diagram earlier that um, let's not forget that whatever it is you put in place in your school, you've got to make sure that your students can actually get to it. And two little things I've learned over the last year was first one was somebody in the um, online teaching group did some research and said something like 80 percent of the university students did not access online classes through a PC, but they used the phone. The other one I heard was something like 50% or more of home students for PLSs, private language school market, this one I was talking to, um, their family didn't really have a PC that was up to date uh, that the children could use. So they had to do it on their mother's smartphone or their own smartphone or a sibling's smartphone or a tablet. Uh, and the PCs also quite often had older software. Uh, going back as far as um, uh, Internet Explorer, which is no longer supported and is actually a security risk. So we've got these considerations of hardware and device. The device is really important and is often, I think, forgotten about. Uh, so many of the um, support questions we get actually relate to the device and the device software, or the fact that this 20-year-old student doesn't have any memory left because it's full of music. And finally, the tangible result and customer satisfaction, of course, those are, are the most important thing, because as a business owner, as a school owner, or as a, a teacher, probably the most important thing to you is the success of your students and of course their satisfaction with that success. Okay, so what I'll do now, just run quickly through a list and then I'll finish and stop for Q&A. So um, let's never forget these considerations. What do your customers, who could be students or it could be parents, but what do they actually need? That hasn't changed. The pandemic has not changed what they need in terms of concept. What they need actually may have changed, but what has not changed is that we need to listen to that. We need to ask them what they need. Uh, we also need to be aware of what our school and the management, office manager or assistants or whoever you have with you, what can they cope with? What can the school cope with? Because delivering something a little bit analog that is very successful is very likely to be a better thing than trying to deliver something which puts you out of your depth and makes you look foolish in front of your customers. Uh, where is the future of your business? Where is it? It's a question. Where, where is the future of your business? Where do you think it is? And make sure you implement a solution that takes you there, not necessarily the next solution you see 
uh, the shiny object that attracts you over there because everybody else is talking about it. Books are dead. Well, they might be. They might not be. Books could be part of a hybrid. Um, and that's some of the stuff I mentioned earlier with they have um, online workbooks and offline workbooks, for example, things like that. Uh, or you can show your book on screen, but actually you use the book in a similar way. So it's sort of hybrid teaching with a book. Online versus normal versions of textbooks or totally online. Why? Why? Why online? Why does a digital book need to be online? Um, and there could be several reasons for that. Uh, but actually, you might not need it online. <clears throat> Think about your Kindle, if you read a Kindle. I mean, your Kindle, I, I download most of the stuff I read. I'm not actually reading it online. I obtain it online. Uh, and then, you know, I tidy my phone up afterwards and get rid of that one and get another one in or a few others at a time so we need to think about the online or the not online aspect quite deeply um one thing to watch out for and um, this list is trying to sort of in the absence of direct questions trying to give you a rounded list of things that we've come across over the last year publishers will often support only in english and only in for example european office hours so if you're going digital with somebody, find out when they will support you. You're paying for it or you're not paying for it, whichever. But the support that's there and support cannot be underestimated. The amount of support you're going to need. Uh, check when you can get it, what language you can get it in. Because if you're like me, uh, an English speaker and you're running a, and if I was running a school, uh, if the support is in English and I'm the only English speaker, then I'm doing the support and that might not be the job I wanted for myself. Uh, infrastructure, you've got to have the Wi-Fi and stuff going on at your school of course and the IT support, never forget that. Um, but in, in addition there's things like uh, uh, access and invoicing, so how do you actually get hold of it, the digital thing, how do your students get hold of it and invoicing is less of a problem but Who's paying for it? Is it you or is it your students? Uh, what's, where does that transaction take place and how? Because some online things are, are subject, are, are invoiced from overseas. I, I subscribe in my own job to a CRM from overseas and I've never met anybody from that company. It's all administered online and paid for online in US dollars. Um, and that's the case with some of the digital items. Bring your own devices or uh, some schools, and you have to be fairly wealthy for that, um, some schools will supply a device. And then platform support. Um, so not just the, the, um, the contents, but actually supporting the platform so that students, parents, uh, teachers can all use it. Um, paying for it, obviously, we've touched with uh, managing, again, and support. You see, support is the thing to watch out for. Um, now, as a supplier, I'm at English Books JP, you need to think about who you're buying it from, <clears throat> because when people buy online books from us, uh, all of the big publishers don't want us to get involved in the administration of the online. In fact, they cut us out, which is fine by me, because it's not a very interesting job, and I'm not trained in it. Uh, but it means that the customer that is mine, and I do care about, has been suddenly pushed to uh, an English only support line. So I, I like to warn the customers that that's gonna happen before they actually shell out for the book. And if they're happy with it, then I'm happy too. Um, so there's lots of pitfalls for online content. Um, and when you pay, you're probably paying to have a sustainable system. And of course, there's many, many others uh, that we could discuss, and we could do some of that now in the few minutes remaining. Um, so in summary, I would say just chick, choose your objectives the, the same way you always have done and stick to them and don't get distracted. Stick to your objectives, whatever you're looking at. Um, and then don't give in to the pressure of other people telling you. Um, take control of the decision uh that is going to deliver you and your students to the right place and your school mission remember that the technology should work for us we should not work for the technology and of course good luck with it 
So that's it from me. Any questions? Excellent presentation, Colin. Uh, very, very good, wide yet brief summary of uh, incredibly challenging uh, environment. I thought it was excellent. Um, from the point of view of a bookseller, do you see a difference in sales of uh, paper books uh, go up or down based on the digital components that are available for the series? Yeah, we have, um, but it's been inconclusive. Um, so we've definitely seen some differences. Uh, and last year we saw quite an upsurge in the demand for the books that have digital components. But actually I would argue it's, it's leveled out quite a bit in the last six months. So since the April buying season, I think there was a lot less of it this year than there was the previous year. So it's probably gone up and then just come down a little bit. It's like the, the stretch, the rubber band. It didn't go right back to where it was, but it's gone back a bit. Mm. And uh, where it goes next is anybody's guess, I would say. Right. Anybody have any questions or comments for Colin? No, feel free to put your mics on and talk. Don't be shy. Do you remember where you were standing when you heard that beer had become a pound of pint? The thing I remember was um, I, had a, I was a student in Liverpool, city of Liverpool, and I had a, my best friend from school was in London. And he told me on the phone that he had hit one pound a pint where he was. Mm. And then within a year, it was a pound, pound a pint up in Liverpool as well. So. Yeah, and what, what year was that? Do you remember about 86, 87, something like that? Yeah, it would have been, yeah. Yeah, about 86-ish, yeah. yeah. Oh. Shocking stuff. Shocking, it was shocking. And now people with beards and pomade have made uh, the, the common man's drink, a boutique drink, and charge four to five pounds for a pint of uh, smelly beer. Oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's indeed true, isn't it? Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. But let us not talk about beer. Let us talk about digital. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, uh, if there's no questions, I'm... Mm. I, I, I think you, you, sum, your summary there at the end, saying, you know, focus on your objectives, is absolutely spot on. Uh, one thing that we always say is that we aim to make learning happen. And in that respect, it doesn't matter whether we use paper or digital, whether we're face-to-face -face online or not. But that's easy to say and very difficult to deal with. Yeah, there's a lot of pressures, I think, on people um, and some, you know, from different places. It could be parents or school administrations suggesting that you have to do this, you must go digital, you must do that. Mm -hmm. But actually, you really need to think, yeah, never, nothing's really changed underneath the surface. You know, people are still people and they, they need certain things in order to move on in their studies. Um, just make sure you're addressing that and the contents and the products you're investing in are, are helping you. Georgie is asking to see the conclusion screen again. So if we could just put that up very briefly before we stop the recording, that would be very helpful. Sure. And I'll be happy to, you know, make my presentation available as yeah, well. Yeah, make the slides available. I can put them, obviously, you can put them out yourself, but I can make them available by the uh, session on our website. Yeah. Uh, so I got the screen thing in the way of sending. There we go. There we go. So, yeah, and you can email me as well um, if you want me to send you the presentation or something. My email's at the bottom of the page. Actually, shouldn't be a capital C there, by the way. <laughs> I don't think it matters, but... Yeah, it probably does. Okay. All right, uh, everybody, if you could put uh, your microphones on and come on screen and give Colin a very large, loud round of applause. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording now.